Over the past 30 days, I have built apps, I've written scripts, I've done some debugging, I've solved technical issues, I've installed Linux on multiple machines and had to figure out weird architecture and driver issues. Um, I had to do architecture research for the apps that I was building to figure out what the right tech stack would be, and a whole lot more, and I did all of that without the help of AI. And in this video, I'm gonna show you what happened. I'm gonna show you the things that I built and talk about what was going through my head when I couldn't reach for AI and answer the question, am I going to use AI going forward? If you missed it, about 30 days ago, I made a video here on this channel called AI Coding Sucks, where I talked about all the things that I don't like about AI when using it with coding. And uh, at the end of the video mentioned that I was gonna take a 30 day break. And I'd love to know if anybody that watched that video and you're now watching this video, did you take a break? Um, or have you made any changes to your workflows since watching that video? And really just let me know, how's, how's it going out there? <laughs> because there was a huge response to that last video. And we can all tell that people are using AI a little bit too much. It's a little bit overhyped. So let's get into it. My name is CJ, welcome to Syntax. So on my first day of coding without AI, the task that I was working on was attempting to reverse engineer how to order pizza on this sexy pizza website. So this is for a challenge that Scott Wes and I are doing. We're all figuring out how to order a pizza with code in various ways. And I was tasked with doing it by reverse engineering. So I basically, I was inspecting the traffic uh, while I was ordering a pizza. And then I wrote some scripts that could order a pizza just by running it directly from the command line. One of the first things I realized when I started writing code without AI is I would just have these urges to want to use AI. It would, I would feel almost like bored or I would feel like what I was doing was repetitive and I would just feel like I'm like <laughs> resisting an urge. Um, it, it felt like being addicted to something and then having urges for that something when you're trying to quit cold turkey. So that absolutely happened for me and especially working on this. So. At the end of the day, it turned out to be a GraphQL API. And in order to order a pizza with it, I had to replicate all of the requests. So it became a very repetitive task of going into the dev tools, figuring out what request was being made, seeing what data was being sent, seeing what data came back, and then writing some code that replicates that. But I constantly felt myself just being like, oh, I feel like AI could do this better. But thinking back, I, the reason I think AI could have done this better is because I had so many examples of it. So my first tip for you and my first takeaway for myself going forward is instead of just immediately jumping in and using AI, if you first write kind of like the core logic or write some examples that AI can learn from, AI is gonna do a lot better job of being consistent. Um, and especially if you're working in a single file. So like I mentioned, the process for coming up with each one of these functions, like get restaurants, add to cart, create payment intent, confirm order, it was the same process and similar code. So for like each one of these functions, I would figure out what is the JSON that needs to be sent to the endpoint. I would figure out the GraphQL query that would need to be sent, put that into a file, call my reusable make request function, write the response into a JSON file so I could use it for debugging, and then come up with a TypeScript type that I could then use to work with all of this stuff in a type safe way. So that was the same process for every single one of these functions that I came up with. And I know that had I done maybe three of these, I could have given a JSON payload and a GraphQL query to AI, and it would have done a really good job of basically replicating exactly what I've done here. Now, over the past 30 days, aside from writing code, I also allowed myself to be more creative. And this has nothing to do with writing code, but I started taking a lot of pictures and I was posting these on X and on Blue Sky. And again, it's nothing to do with code, but being creative and also working on a skill was fun for me. It, it, I got a lot of enjoyment out of it. Um, and so maybe that's my next tip for you is like get enjoyment out of other things, not just coding. Um, but also I think a lot about how AI is kind of infiltrating our social feeds and the media that we consume. And more and more going forward, there are going to be less and less real people creating content. So I want to be one of those people creating real content, even if it's not coding or AI related. Um, so I practiced taking a lot of photos. I was in Japan. I took some some pretty cool photos um, that I, I think are I think are pretty decent. I'm working on my, my composition. Uh, and so, again, nothing to do with coding, but I I just want to scratch creative itches now more when I have them. Um, and I'm going to start to do that more. And I think I'm getting pretty good at taking photos, if, if you don't mind me saying that myself. Uh, I'm working on like composition and color. And uh, I got this I got this seagull to look at the camera, which was pretty fun. Um, so yeah, takeaway here, be more creative. Don't just get your creative enjoyment from coding. And in a world where more and more stuff is AI generated, be the real human creator 
uh, that brings interesting perspectives and real world things for people to see rather than just AI generated stuff. Okay, so the next piece of code that I was working on last month was for a talk that I gave at HonoConf. So I got to go to Japan and uh, give a talk at their conference. It was super fun. I got to meet Aditya um, and Yusuke, the creator of Hono. So it was, it was a good time. But when I was working on the talk, uh, when I create slides, I like to have interesting background images for my slides. And so I was using a tool called Slide Dev to create this slide deck, which I've used in the past. It's fantastic, but I wanted a way to download images from Pexels. So Pexels has royalty-free images you can use, but I wanted to be able to credit the author. And pro tip for people giving talks, you should make sure that your talks work offline. So I wanted to write a script that given a URL to an image from Pexels, it could download it, keep track of all the metadata, store it so I can put it in a references file and have a locally downloaded image that I can use as a background image so I don't need to be connected to the internet whenever the slides are loaded up. So this is just a simple Node.js script. It's called Get Background. Um, one of the first things is I had to look up how to read in arguments uh, when you're writing a Node script. So it's process.argv. I feel like this is something that as a Node developer, you probably memorize, but I hadn't done it in so long. I had to look it up. And then that made me think about how when I did look something up, I, a lot of times I was just pulling directly from Stack Overflow. And I don't know why it feels weird to read, pull things from Stack Overflow now, but now maybe it's because the, the posts that I'm reading on Stack Overflow look very similar to the code that AI uh, was outputting. So I kind of had this urge to, instead of reaching for Stack Overflow first, I would actually go directly to the documentation and start searching there. Uh, and one of the things that helped me with this was a site called DevDocs. And this basically allows you to have offline documentation. And they have a lot of various apps that they've done this for, well, documentation websites, where you can load them and then it works completely offline. So here you can see that I have the Node.js documentation. And from there, I can start to search for args. And then this, this is just the direct documentation, but it works completely offline. So one of the first things I did was go to the direct docs more when I was trying to figure stuff out instead of just reading from Stack Overflow. And then another thing I needed to look at the docs for in here was I wanted to download an image over a URL and then write that image to the file system. And so this is something that AI could probably just poop out pretty instantly, uh, but it took me a little bit to figure out in the docs how to do this exactly. And then after that, it puts the local path to the file in my clipboard with PV copy so that when I'm inside of my slides, I can just easily paste in the local link to the image instead of the remote link. So it's a silly little script. AI probably could have pooped this out, but the main takeaway for this particular coding task was really just depending more on the docs rather than even Stack Overflow, because this, this is another potential issue going forward in the age of AI is there is less and less questions being asked and answered on Stack Overflow because people are using AI for everything. So we'll potentially get to a point where there isn't a resource like Stack Overflow to pull answers from, and we're gonna have to be dependent a lot more on the docs. So getting good at reading the docs, practicing reading the docs, practicing searching the docs, finding tools that let you use the docs locally. These are all things that I'm gonna keep doing even if I start adding more AI into my workflow. Okay, the next bit of code I worked on in these 30 days was a game for the Sentry and Syntax booth at GitHub Universe. So we had a booth there with lots of cool merch that people could come get. But we also had this game called Spot the Syntax Error. So this was running on several different iPads and someone could come up to play the game and uh, they have to scan their badge. Uh, let me do that really quick. Okay, so you scan the badge, confirm that it's you and then start to play the game. So there's a countdown timer. And then in this code, there's a syntax error. Can you spot it? Pause the video. Um, it's right here. We're missing the parentheses around this, uh, the function arguments. So. If you find it, you get points, and then you move on to the next one. Can you spot it? Pause the video. <laughs> I'm missing semicolon. Submit it. Move on to the next one. So this is the game. Actually, this is this is a fun one too. What was the syntax error? Pause the video. Missing semicolon, right? Because if you don't put a semicolon there, then JavaScript thinks you're trying to access 10 as an array. So give it an error. I don't know. Uh, this is this is the game that I built. And it's got a lot of different aspects to it, right? So there's the real-time leaderboard. So every iPad should show the latest updates to the leaderboard because it's a competition. People want to get at the top of the leaderboard. Also, I need to keep track of what the user is doing. So every time they answer a question, that's getting stored in a database. Also, if somebody happens to figure out what the website URL is, I don't want them to be able to go there and then just download all of the answers. So I've architected it in a way 
where the answers are not revealed on the front end and all of the validation of where you clicked happens on the back end. Um, and it was really fun to work on. I think the the one takeaway from working on this particular code base was uh, I had to figure out how I was going to store the data. So it needed to be real time for the leaderboard. My gut thought was maybe we should use Supabase for this because they do real time. Um, and then I also thought, okay, maybe I should look into this convex thing because a lot of people are using that. And then I was like, well, maybe I should just use Firebase because I've used that in the past and it's pretty easy. And then I was like, well, maybe I just use MongoDB. <laughs> but um, my main takeaway from this is technical spikes and figuring out what tech you want to use and what fits for a particular problem that you're trying to solve. That potentially I would offload to an AI. But I almost think of this as like an agent task. Like I have this particular app that I want to build. Let's build out a, a minimal demo with Supabase, Convex, Firebase, and also like MongoDB with so WebSockets and compare the minimal implementation to see which one of those paths I want to go down to build the overall application. Um, but I did that by hand <laughs> and, it, and it took probably an hour or two. Uh, and there were caveats and reasons why I didn't pick one over the other and ultimately just settled on Firebase. Firebase real time, not even Fire, Firestore. For this particular app, that made sense for me. But the act of figuring out what tech I want to use, that is still something that should be in a human's control. We shouldn't just give all of that to the AI, but you could potentially use AI to do those tech spikes for you and then come back with an analysis and resulted comparison of what you should actually use yourself. So it's the kind of thing I missed about being able to use AI and especially agents is like set it off on something so that I don't have to do the work. Yeah, I guess the main takeaway is AI could do that work, but I keep coming back to this is all stuff that I've now internalized and is why I'm good at what I do, right? Like I used to work as a consultant and clients would bring us app ideas and it was my job to determine like, was it technically feasible? If it was, what tech stack are we going to use to build it out? How long would it take? What are some unknowns? All of this are things that I've internalized and now make me more of a senior developer because I can make informed decisions and, and come to a conversation informed. And if you're using AI to answer all of those questions for you, you're not doing that. And it's going to be a lot harder for you to level up. Okay, this next thing that I worked on wasn't writing code, but it was installing and configuring a Linux system. So November is traditionally novel writing month. A, a bit of backstory. So there was this organization called NaNoWriMo. Every November, people would write, log their goals. That organization is now defunct for various reasons, but it's been reincarnated as Novel November. And my wife is an aspiring writer. So she has been working on her book and wanting to write. And I also want to get into writing as well. But the whole idea with these writer decks, as what they're called, is distraction-free writing. And the idea that these days our laptops, our phones, they're all extremely distracting because they're multi-purpose devices, right? You could be attempting to work on your novel in Google Docs, but you're going to get pinged on iMessage or you're going to start browsing Reddit or Twitter or something else. So these devices are typically sometimes not connected to the internet and it gives you kind of a distraction-free drafting experience. Um, and if you're into hardware, these things are just fascinating to build to see some of the things that people build with like their own contraptions with like mechanical keyboards and interesting screens and Raspberry Pis. So this is a whole fun world to get into. And I wanted to do something like this, but in an even easier and more minimal way uh, because I have a bunch of old laptops just sitting around. So uh, I have this, this, this cute little boy here. Uh, it's a netbook that I got back in, I think like 2008 or 2009. Uh, but this is perfect for a writer deck. Obviously I didn't build it myself, but it's a little 10 inch laptop. Um, and it, 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 it's perfect because it fits in your lap. I didn't have to build anything, uh, custom. Um, but the main thing is to get it set up as a drafting device. I wanted to do some things to make it more user-friendly, but at the end of the day, um, I set it up so that it boots strictly just to the terminal. There's no graphical user interface. It's pure TTY. Um, and then I'm using a program called Micro, which is like an easier version of Nano. But again, it's distraction free. You can't start watching YouTube on this thing because it literally doesn't even have a graphical user interface. But I set out to get that working on this laptop and I, and I came across quite a few challenges. Uh, the first being that this has a 32 bit processor and all of the major Linux distributions now are 64 bit. But if you use Debian Bookworm version 12, 
it actually does support 32-bit, so I spent some time researching and figuring that out. Um, and then from there, I wanted it to automatically log in. I wanted it to go to sleep whenever I close the lid and then allow me to just start writing again when I open the lid. And as a more modern feature, I wanted it to sync all of the things that I was writing to Git automatically. So I set it up so that the editor is auto-saving every 60 seconds and it's committing to a Git repo and there's a background service I have running that automatically pushes those changes to a Git remote. So you can be sure that if this thing dies or whatever else, or if you accidentally maybe lose your work or want to go back, there's a full Git history that shows you all of the writing work that you've done. So that's what I did with this little Linux device. But the main takeaways here were, we're kind of doomed <laughs> because uh, when I'm working on a project like this, I'm just doing lots and lots of searching of the web. And you could, technically ask these questions to ChatGPT or Claude. And so like the first question I had is, what is a modern Linux distribution that supports 32-bit? And uh, that actually took me a while to even find a correct answer for. And so I'm just showing you my search history here. And oh yeah, one of the other things I did was I set it up so you could use a custom font. So I found a program called FB Term, and that lets you use any true type font in the console. So at one point I even had like Comic Sans running. I, it's fun, I'm just like nerding out on it. But these are all things that I needed to figure out. Uh, in order to get this thing working. But there were multiple times where the AI provided answer in DuckDuckGo and in Google was actually wrong about what Linux commands I should run. And so that's one thing is depending on these AI tools to help answer your questions, even though it looks like they're citing good sources, sometimes they're wrong. And so the only way I could figure that out is actually going in and reading uh, the man pages or older articles that were published before 2021 <laughs> that had good relevant information about what I was trying to do. The other issue here is those AI provided answers a lot of times were sourced in sourcing articles that themselves were written by AI. This is why I'm saying we're doomed is basically these AI slop producer blogs and websites are just pumping out content. There's one particular site. Um, actually, I don't want to call them out. I'm going to call them out because I mean, it's pretty obvious that linuxvox.com uses AI to generate these articles. And if you start searching the web for how to do things in Linux, linuxvox.com is gonna start to pop up. And basically what they've done is they've kind of like scraped the, the, the topmost searches for how to do things in Linux, and they've just AI slopped their way into an article. Now, some of these are perfectly fine, but sometimes they're not. And sometimes the AI provided answers on DuckDuckGo or Google or even in ChatGPT will link to linuxvox.com because it did a web search and then it's providing inaccurate information. So this is why I'm saying we're doomed is more and more things are just being generated by AI and then AI is using that AI generated stuff to answer questions and we're getting inaccurate answers. Um, and so what am I gonna do going forward? What is my learning here? I don't know, I have a lot to think about here because we are kind of getting to the point where the internet before ChatGPT was released is kind of like this gold mine of non-AI slop generated stuff. And it could be that for certain things that we're trying to do, we need a search engine that does not have any results from after the year of 2021 or 2022. I guess ChatGPT came out at the end of 2022 uh, because AI is using itself to output AI, which is also using itself to output AI. But I think the main theme here and the, the, the thing that I'm going to take going forward, because I'm, I'm going to start using AI at least a little bit, is do the work up front yourself and then start to incorporate AI so that it takes into account um, all of your preferences and potentially some patterns that you've already developed for it. Um, same thing for coming up with architecture or deciding what libraries to use. I think that should be a human problem, right? We, we are the experts. We should do those things. And if you don't have that expertise, you should work on that expertise and not depend on AI to choose a library or figure out what your tech stack is because all of those decisions you make are decisions that you'll carry with you for the rest of your career and you'll be able to talk confidently in a meeting or uh, back up the opinions that you have based on all of this work that you've done. Um, and so going forward, I'm going to keep doing that. I, I think kind of what I got into before this past 30 days was just depending on AI too much and potentially feeling like I could trust it too much or it was making more, me more productive. And I, what I'm realizing is it has its uses, but it shouldn't be used for everything.